Hello and welcome to Cosmos Briefing. I'm Amalia Hart and I'm a science journalist at Cosmos. Today I'm speaking with Professor David Lindenmeyer. He's an ecologist and conservation biologist at the Australian National University. A lot of David's research focuses on tree dwelling marsupials, birds and other creatures and how their populations are faring in the forests and woodlands of southeastern Australia, but really he wears many hats. He specializes in large scale long term projects that monitor the conservation of species in our forests, plantations, national parks and farmlands. Thank you so much for joining me today, David. Can you please tell me a bit about your field of research and what you specialize in? Okay, so I'm a biodiversity scientist, conservation biologist and ecologist, and I work on the effects of logging, the effects of plantation development, the effects of agriculture on biodiversity and ways to better integrate the way we use landscapes with the way that we um, try to conserve biodiversity. And how did you get involved in conservation biology? Gosh, I originally started my career as a, as a marine biologist uh, working in Townsville, and that was my undergraduate degree. And then as time sort of developed, I became more interested in forests and, and wildlife, terrestrial wildlife. Then I got interested in wildlife surveys in particular areas, and it's kind of evolved in various steps ever since then. So you know, that's part of the journey, I suppose, that, that takes place when you do these kinds of things, just that you never end up where you think you're going to. And, and the journey is as interesting as the end point. Yeah, I suppose that's the exciting thing about it all. Absolutely. Now, I know that you're running a few long-term and larger scale projects here in Australia. Can you tell me a bit about those? I, I specialise in large scale long-term research programs. So one of the ones in the Victorian forest has been running since mid-1983. Then we have other studies, a very long-term study. It's been going uh, over 25 years in the plantation systems to the west of Canberra. These plantation areas of radiata pine are expanding. We're interested in what happens in the little patches of woodland and forest that are left over within these huge plantations. So that's a giant fragmentation experiment. And then beyond that, we're also looking at what happens when we start to go through restoration studies in farmland, particularly all the, the effort around replantings, shelter belts. Uh, and in England, people would know those as hedgerows, but in Australia, they're shelter belts or, or linear plantings. And then in more recent times, we've also started to look at what happens on those agricultural landscapes when we begin to renovate and restore farm dams and what happens not only to the biodiversity, but also the greenhouse gas emissions from the dams and the quality of the water. And then another, yet another study is at Jarvis Bay, Buddhari National Park, which is looking at the, the effects of fire and feral animal control on different elements of the biodiversity, particularly the birds, the reptiles and the mammals. And what's happening in that system where foxes are being taken out, rabbits are being taken out, and the system is starting to go on a very different trajectory without those introduced species in the system. And what are you finding in all these? I mean, I know it's a broad swathe of projects, but what are the kind of general trends that you're, you're noticing? So what we're seeing, for example, in forest ecosystems is that there's quite a strong degradation of forest biodiversity as a consequence of ongoing logging and the, the interactions between logging and fire. So what we've started to discover in the last 10 years or so is that logged forests always burn at much higher severity than intact forests. So one of those big issues therefore is that biodiversity has to deal not only with fire and not only with logging, but actually the interaction of the two, which really reinforces one another. So these systems are now dealing with too much disturbance, which is really driving down biodiversity quite steeply. In those systems. So it's not only the possums and gliders, but some of the plants and many of the bird species are not, not traveling well as a consequence of too much disturbance. Then what we're seeing in the woodland environments is that restored areas do make a difference to starting to recover biodiversity, but the effectiveness of that recovery is sometimes undermined by how much additional grazing takes place in the restored areas. 
So again, it's thinking deeply about the amount of disturbance, the type of disturbance, and how different forms of disturbance interact with one another. So often we, we've got to think deeply about how you manage for those interacting disturbances if we want to hold on to some of the elements of biodiversity there. And does that inform any sort of conservation strategies or, or things like that? Absolutely, it does. So uh, in, in the forest context, there's clearly a need for a, a very strongly expanded reserve system because logging is often taking place in the areas of highest conservation value for many, many elements of biodiversity. In the, in the areas of, of temperate woodlands, the vast majority of that country will never be conserved as reserves, formal reserves. So there's a need to work very carefully with farmers and other land managers to try to make sure that they can better balance agricultural production, livestock grazing and biodiversity. So there are some, some good rules of thumb in terms of limiting grazing impacts and working hard to boost the amount of native vegetation cover that's in the landscape. So often we can distill some of the key findings, which can be very complex, but we can distill them down into general rules of thumb and principles that help managers to better think about what they're doing. Yeah. And what would you say is the most kind of promising or exciting thing about the work that you're doing? Oh, I think that the constant discoveries. So we, we continue to, to collect large scale long term data sets. And the real creativity comes in continuing to ask new questions around what's happening to biodiversity, how's it changing, why is it changing in the way it does, and making discoveries, new discoveries about how things change and sometimes how quickly they change. So, for example, we know that when we start to, to restore the areas around farm dams, we can see very quickly that bird biodiversity, frog biodiversity, and many of the invertebrates start to recover quite quickly, sometimes within six months. And at the same time, we can also see a, a dramatic change in water quality. Uh, so, so many of these farm dams that you might see when you're driving from, say, Melbourne to Sydney or Sydney to Brisbane, they're in very poor quality. They're in very poor condition. And the water quality that, the, that they maintain in those dams is, is often very, very poor. It's uh, often got a lot of fecal coliforms, a lot of e, e. coli. And when we invest in renovating those dams, you can drive down the amounts of those really nasty things in the water, sometimes by up to half within six to 12 months. And we can reduce the greenhouse gas, and gas emissions from those farm dams also by half within six to nine months, which is really quite an extraordinary turnaround. And why are those dams emitting greenhouse gases in the first place? So the farm dams are often located in the lowest parts of the landscape in a particular paddock or pasture area because the idea is that you're trying to collect the runoff during a, a rain event. And the most effective places to do that are where the dams are in the lowest point of the landscape. But usually what happens is that in those same paddocks, you've got animals that are grazing, so they're pooing and weeing everywhere. And when you get a rain event on the pasture, that washes all those extra nutrients into the dam. And so you, you have a lot of nitrogen, so nitrogen and water can end up with nitrous oxide. And then you have a lot of other waste, which leads to methane and methane emissions. So you've got some very dangerous greenhouse gases that have a very high forcing component to them that end up mixing with water. So a, a waste, a rain on waste event, where all the material ends up in the farm dam. And that's, that's a, an absolute nightmare for creating literally millions of hotspot points for greenhouse gas emissions. So your average farm dam can emit as, as much greenhouse gas as a small car fleet. And so being able to tackle that problem by planting around the dam to sift out the sediments, keeping the water quality high, the nitrous oxide and the, the methane emissions from the farm dam, that really makes a massive difference because you know, Australia has close to 1.8 million farm dams and the estimated emissions are equivalent to about the landfill sector. So there's, there's a lot that comes off those dams. So a good conservation and restoration intervention that improves the quality of the dam can make it a colossal difference, especially when we think about the fact that we've lost so many wetlands and those farm dams are often a, a proxy for wetlands. So 
we can serve the farm dams well, we can serve the water quality, we can also conserve a lot of biodiversity and have a production impact because cows and sheep are drinking better water. That's fascinating. I had no idea that dams were such a big polluter. And I know that you also do a lot of work in the sort of southeastern forest areas of Australia. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yes, we've been working on on forest biodiversity since the mid-1980s. And we've looked at the effects of logging, the effects of fire, the effects of the interaction of the two, the habitat requirements of the different the different species in those in those landscapes, how so many different species of birds and so many species of possums and gliders can coexist. How do they partition the resource, the forest resource, so that they can broadly coexist? How do the different species respond differently to, to uh, different kinds of disturbance? And how would you design conservation strategies to keep those species in the landscape? And so there's there's a lot of thinking there about changes in the amount of old growth forest, why that's important, what happens to species when you lose old growth, uh, which species are the ones that are most susceptible, which ones are going to recover through restoration efforts, which ones are going to be strongly dependent on large scale reserve systems, those kinds of approaches to, to conservation and forest management. And what are some iconic Australian forest species that are under threat? So there's several several species in the forest that we work in. There's an absolutely magical animal called the greater glider. It's like a small gliding koala, essentially. It eats only eucalypt leaves. It's completely silent, so it's unlike a koala. It's susceptible to fire. It's susceptible to land clearing. It's susceptible to logging. It's heat sensitive, so it's sensitive to climate change. And so all of these things are really quite important in that species reflecting the different stresses that are now impacting on the forest. So, so the greater glider is a classic example of a species that's declining dramatically in the wet forests of Victoria. It's declining in the, in the, the spotted gum and coastal blackbutt forests in the, in the Jarvis Bay area. It's sensitive to fragmentation in the tumor study. We can see with that species that that's declining just about everywhere. And the real concern is that what we used to think was one species from basically Melbourne all the way to North Queensland is actually three species and perhaps as many as five. And so some of these newly discovered species, like in that greater glider complex, are going to be very, very threatened as time goes on. So the greater glider is one. There's another species called the yellow belly glider which has this remarkable call that sounds like a cross between a, a frothing cappuccino machine and a squealing pig, if you can imagine that. And that species is also declining quite dramatically, not only as a consequence of fires, but it's also very logging sensitive as well. So uh, there are species like that in these forest systems that are doing very badly and declining incredibly quickly. So the greater glide has declined by more than 80% in the last 20 years alone. Wow, that's, that's confronting. So, I mean, you've touched on a few of the different factors, but what are the biggest threats to Australian biodiversity today, in your view? So the biggest threats, if we look at mammals and reptiles and birds, the biggest threats in order, feral animals, so foxes and cats, and land clearing. Now, these things go together. The more land clearing you do, the better it is for foxes and cats. Horses, pigs, deer, foxes, cats, camels, rabbits, you name it, Australia seems to have it. They're, those are really serious threats. And then underlying that is, is land clearing, which is also a major problem, huge problem in Australia. You know, Australia has rates of land clearing not dissimilar to parts of you know, equatorial Africa and the Amazon. On top of that, we've got climate change, altered fire regimes, logging, expansion of urban settlements. So there's a number of these key drivers of, of species loss and species decline that are really very important in those systems. So, you know, if you were prime minister for a day, what would be your ideal conservation strategy? How do we fix the problems facing Australia's biodiversity? Uh, we have to make much, much larger investments in biodiversity and our environment. You know, to me, it's absurd that we're investing 100, 100 billion, not million, 100 billion dollars in a fleet of submarines, which are likely to be obsolete before they're even constructed. Yet we're completely unable to invest at a sensible level for biodiversity conservation in Australia. 
And so we need to have appropriate investments. So if I was Prime Minister for a day, I would uh, lift the level of investment in the environment because it has enormous payback. At the same time, I would create a true trust fund that would fund long-term restoration efforts and better management efforts. So it's not, it's not a granting system at the behest of a particular minister, but it's actually a trust that's paying out significant amount of money each year to repair the damage that's been done to the Australian environment over the last two centuries. Now, it's taken us 220 years to, to make a really big mess. It's not gonna take two or three years to fix it up. Some of these are long-term efforts and some of these efforts need to be ongoing. You know, just because we have a successful uh, suppression of rabbits or foxes or cats for a short period of time, doesn't mean it's always gonna be like that. And so we have to have sustained efforts backed by good science to, to really take us somewhere. The, the other thing I would do would be to uh, reinstigate the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. That was very successful. And it was very important for targeted science to help us better manage our threatened species. The fourth thing I would do would be legal reform. So I would be looking at revising our environmental laws so it's possible to avoid the problems of death by a thousand cuts. And at the same time, it, it's critical to make sure that we do the, the interventions and the monitoring to recover species. So in Australia, what happens is that all we end up doing is getting longer and longer and longer and longer lists of threatened species. Whereas in America, where they invest in these things properly, it's possible to take many species off the threatened species list because the right interventions have been done and the right monitoring has been done to show that those interventions are working. So, you know, we're, we're wasting colossal amounts of money by not having proper funding and grant systems, proper monitoring, and a proper adherence to making sure that our medium to long-term efforts are going to be effective. Now, of course, there's a lot of challenges here, but what do you love about the type of science that you do? Uh, I love the discoveries. I love being out in the bush itself and, and seeing new things. Uh, I don't think there's ever a time that I've ever walked in the bush and I walk in our local bushland every day. And I don't think there's ever been a day in the last 25 years where I haven't seen something new or appreciated something different. And that's a real source of excitement. Some of our discoveries, we've discovered new species of possums, for example. Now those, that's remarkable in a place like Australia where you know, there are so many new things to discover about how biodiversity works. And, and being able to make a contribution to hopefully leave Australia eventually in a better condition than it was 50 years ago would be a, a, a real sense of achievement if we can hopefully achieve that. And if we can't achieve that, hopefully then Australia will be less bad than it might have otherwise have been. Thank you so much, David. It's been lovely to have you on. And Pleasure. speak soon. Good. Thanks very much. <laughs>